Good evening, Encounter Community Groups. Um, welcome back. Last community group, you guys had the honor of hearing from my husband. He did an awesome job. It was fire. Um, tonight, you're going to hear from me. I'm Charlie, in case you don't know me. Um, I get to preach on worship and God transforms. That's the doctrine that I have tonight. So I uh, hope you guys are enjoying your time together and that um, uh, thanking your hosts for opening their homes to you because that's a big job. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with prayer and just jump right in because I have a lot to do. So, um, Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to dive into your word tonight with everybody. I thank you for an opportunity to be a vessel to you, God. I just ask that you would come, Holy Spirit, come in this moment, anoint the words that are yours and any word from me, let it fall to the ground. God, I ask that you prepare hearts, that you would bring revelation and that you would bring conviction where there needs to be conviction and soften the hearts that need to be softened, God. I just thank you again for this opportunity for us to all come together and to worship you together and to live life together. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, so first question, what is worship? Worship is giving glory, honor, um, praise, lifting up to a God or a deity. Uh, we're going to jump into God's definition first. God's, God defines worship in Romans 11:36 36 um, through 12, 1. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, worship is not just a Christian thing. Worship is a human being thing. We were made to worship. It's in our very nature. And Christians, you, you know, you see that we worship in churches. We worship by singing songs, listening to sermons, preaching, um, laying hands on the sick and praying. There's so many different ways that we worship. But um, non-Christians worship too. Non-Christians worship maybe in bars, in sports arenas. They worship with their families. They worship um, at their jobs. It's anything basically that you focus your time, attention, passion, money, obedience, desire, whatever you focus these things on, that is your object of worship. And we get to choose who or what we worship. Worship is lifting up, exalting, and ultimately giving leadership and authority. Um, we can choose to either worship the creator or the created. In Romans 1.25, it says, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. Satan fell because of his pride and his desire to be worshipped. He thought that he deserved the same glory that was given to the Lord. And so he basically took a third of the angels and fell to the earth. They were the worshipers, but he took them with them. And then he went and deceived Adam and Eve into choosing to worship themselves as well instead of their desire to worship God. Who worships God? God worships. I know that sounds funny, but it's true. God worships. John 17, 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. This is Jesus talking. Jesus was fully God, fully man, and he worshiped God, and he submitted himself fully to God. So he demonstrates worship for us, and I'll get into that later. It's actually really cool how beautifully Jesus paints the picture of worship in many different facets. Next, the divine council worships in heaven. In Revelation 4, 2 through 8, it says, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. From the throne comes flashes of light, lightning and rollings, uh, rumblings and peals of thunder, and therefore the throne, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like that of an eagle in flight." And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, day and night. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So even when we look at the picture of heaven, when we look at what is happening in heaven, day and night for all eternity, we see what? We see worship. Um, departed Christians 
actually worship in heaven. Revelation 4, 9 through 11. So this is just continuing later in the verse. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, Lord our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Then spirit-filled Christians worship on earth, John 4, 23 through 24. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And then um, I'm just going to read real quickly Philippians 3.3. 3, we worship by the spirit of God. So this is actually saying that the Holy Spirit is our worship leader. When we worship by the spirit, he's t it's talking about the spirit of God. The spirit of God actually enables us to declare Jesus is Lord. To te he teaches us to worship. He teaches our hearts to submit to the will of God and lift God up. So he was the original worship leader. Okay, so we're going to go into what is Christian worship. Sorry, this is very scripture heavy. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everything that you see here was founded in the word. So um, what is Christian worship? Hebrews 13, 15 through 6. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips and acknowledge his name. Do not neglect, neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Christian worship is essentially private and public God-glorifying, internal adoration and external action by the Spirit, through the Son, and to the Father. What does worship look like? I'm going to just read a list really quickly. They have, I have scriptures for every single one. If you have a question, I can give you scriptures for every single one of these things, but I'm just going to kind of blow through them really quickly just to kind of give a picture of what worship looks like. Um, the first one, heartfelt internally. So when you worship and you're connecting with Father God, you're connecting with his spirit, you feel that internal heartfelt connection with him. That can be worship, just connecting with his spirit. There are holy forms externally, demonstrations, um, things that we speak and, and things that we do with our lives. That's holy forms externally. We can go prost prostrate face down. We can dance. We can clap. We can show reverence. Um, there's bowing. A lot of people will bow in reverence before the Lord. That's a form of worship. Kneeling, getting down on your knees. Um, laying on of hands, when we lay on of hands, and there's actually, the Holy Spirit can be transferred through the laying on of hands when we're praying for someone or ministering to them. Falling down, there are people that get slain in the Spirit and fall out under the weight of his presence. That's a form of worship. It's an ultimate surrender. Um, playing musical instruments. The band up here is not just to sound good, but it's a form of worship unto the Father. Writing new worship songs, something that just comes and is birthed out of your spirit. Um, that's what David did. David was a psalmist. He wrote songs of worship from his experiences and from his, his, um, his worship to the Lord, what he felt about the Lord, what he experienced about God's goodness. He would write songs. Singing loudly doesn't mean good, doesn't mean beautiful, but singing boldly before his throne and before men. Um, standing. You know, we see at sports arenas, people will give standing um, they'll jump up out of their seat and stand when they're excited about something. Or when someone of honor walks into a room, you stand and clap for them. That's a way of showing honor and worship. Sitting. Um, sometimes sitting in their presence, like you see Mary of Bethany sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's a form of worship. Sitting and taking a low place at his feet. Shouting amen. Getting it, um, vocally declaring, yes, I agree. Yes, that's good. Yes, my spirit relates. Serving with your spiritual giftings, that is definitely a form of worship. When you minister in an area and you say yes to the Lord, even if it's outside of your comfort zone, and you minister to someone um, or the Lord through your gifts, that's definitely a form of worship. Giving tithes and offering. This is a hard one, and this is a big subject that I wish I had time to go into, but we can worship with our money, and we either worship ourselves and our fleshly desires, or we can sub submit our finances under the under the Lord, because the thing is, is ultimately, 
everything we have comes from the Lord. Everything below him that was made by him is his. We are just stewards of it. And we get to choose whether we're going to be obedient with that and use everything that we have in a form of submission and worship unto the Lord and doing what's right with it. Or we can hoard it for ourselves and say, this is mine. And um, really, you know, no one can serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24, I didn't have them put this verse up there, but it says, no one can serve two masters for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's interesting that he lists God and money so distinctly because they both pull at your heart. If you want to check and see if you have areas of your life that are unsubmitted in worship, look at your pocketbook. Look at whether or not you're submitting your money through tithing and offering, um, whether your money is spent more on yourself or helping others. It's definitely something that you should look into. I'm going to move on past, though. I have a lot to cover. Sorry. Um, Is there a... Oh, I was going to just really quickly share something the Lord put on my heart about the different forms of worship. You know, I just mentioned a bunch of different ways that you can be demonstrative in your worship. And God brought to mind um, for me David and Michael, the story of David and Michael. And David, in so longing to have the presence of God, so longing to have his presence rest in the city of David in his kingdom, that he went out and got the ark and brought it back. And you've all heard the story about the cart and the oxen and it falling and um, the, the man being struck dead. And then you see David come into the city and he has stripped down. After he's gone and gotten the, the ark from um, Obed-Edom, he gets, the, he gets the ark and he strips down into a, a linen ephod and he begins dancing with all of his might and enthusiasm, singing songs, clapping, dancing, worshiping before the Lord. And his wife, Michael, sees from afar and looks down on him and begins to scoff and mock him. And she challenges him and says, you know, you're not worthy of a king. Look at you, you know. And she was very disgraced by his public display of worship unto the Lord. And ultimately, her punishment for mocking his worship unto the Lord was barrenness. God struck her womb as barren. And, you know, I would just be very careful about mocking someone else's form of worship or judging it because it may end up drying up your spiritual womb that you birth praise and worship out of and everything. So anyway, I just thought I would throw that out there. Um, is there a wrong way to worship now that we're on the subject of worship? Yes. You can have, um, we can have interfaith relationships with people. We can have, you know, relationships with other walks of faith, but we cannot have interfaith worship. We cannot worship the Lord our God in ways that pagans worship their gods, other religions worship their gods, because it's not our God. And he's very specific in the ways that he wants to be worshipped, and we have to honor him in the ways that he wants to be honored. We don't want to uh, dishonor him by trying to bring pagan worship ways into the worship that we have unto our God. So um, some of that includes worshiping demons and angels and stars, you know, looking at horoscopes. And um, there are different pagan rituals that people do, like setting up shrines to the dead and things like that. Um, Worshiping nature and ultimately even worshiping other people. So human beings were made to worship God doesn't need worship. Let's get that straight. God does not need our worship. He, do, he lacks nothing. But what he desires is worshipers. And the whole reason that we worship is to be submitted unto him. So that when we submit our will to him, we take on his will for our lives. And we begin to be transformed and renewed in our spirits and our minds. And who we are, we become more like him. And we become closer to him we actually have a deeper walk of intimacy when we worship him. It's a connection to our spirit man and his that we were made for. We crave worship. And that's why I say it's not just for Christians, but non-Christians also. You see people desire to be passionately engaged, to be stirred up, to pour themselves out. And it just all depends on who and what you're doing that to and for. In the garden, in the very beginning, God designed us to worship. And in the garden, that's the perfect reflection of that. Worship was Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the day with the Lord, communing with him with no hindrance. There was no separation. They could talk to him whenever they wanted to. There was just that complete fellowship. And that's what we were designed for. Um, No separation, but complete unity with the Father. 
And as we worship him and look at him and glorify him and lift him up and we are drawn closer, we see him rightly, we see ourselves rightly, and then we begin to see his kids, our sisters and brothers in Christ rightly, and then we are transformed to be more like his son, Jesus. And we are able to move in our giftings and move in in the anointings on our lives uh, more effectively. When we... um, When we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, at first we accept him as our Savior. We are face-to-face with our sin. We are face-to-face with what he did for us, and we're overcome by his sacrifice. And we accept him as our Savior and absolving us of all of our sins, forgiving us of all of our sins. And when we do that, we accept his service to us. But when we accept him as Lord over our lives, you cannot just accept him as Savior, but Lord. When we accept him as Lord of our lives, we ultimately serve him. See, there's that give and take relationship. He served us by dying on the cross for us. But then he, if we come under him as Lord and make him have lordship over our lives and submit our will to him, then we're serving him in return. So worship has been a very coveted thing and under attack since the very beginning. First, we talked about it earlier. Satan wanted worship that belonged to God for himself. And when he was cast out of heaven, he took a third of the worshiping angels with him. Then Adam and Eve, Satan deceived them into turning their eyes away from God and obedience and worship to him and instead exalting themselves, their desires, their will. And then you see this throughout the rest of time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read. It's kind of a chunk of scripture, but Genesis 3, 1 through 10. Um, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And when they heard the sounds of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. See, before they were so used to communing with God openly, freely, there was no sin hindering them from the presence of God. They were submitted in worship to him and they hadn't questioned it at that point. But when they were awakened to their own will and desire and Uh, deceived into exalting themselves in their own wills and desires, that's when the separation came and their immediate response was to hide. And I would challenge you that if there's something in your life that's causing you to hide, that's causing you to pull back from the presence of the Lord to say no to him and cover yourself, I would suggest that that's a place of unsubmitted will and worship in your life. That's a place where you're worshiping self and pride and your own desires and will, and not submitting in obedience to the Lord. And um, I have definitely dealt with that a lot in my life. I have let fear of man and fear of the eyes of man and that approval, um, the fear of not being good enough, the pride and, um, and fear of, of being insufficient and disqualified make me hide. I've had that make me hide many times from my call and from being obedient to his call to step out in faith and release a word he's given me or release a song he's given me or to reach out to people. Um, I've had that hinder me quite a bit. So I've had to do a lot of looking over my heart the last month or so and really see, Lord, where am I not submitted to you? Where have I not made you Lord? Where I may have accepted you as Savior and I let you forgive me of my sin and um, take away the shame and the guilt of all of that, but the hiding is still there where I'm still not being completely obedient and I'm not walking in the freedom and the fullness of what God has for me. And really what, that's what that does. Unsubmitted worship, you know, when you're worshiping yourself and your own will, it hinders you from what God has for you. You're out of his will at that point. Um, 
So um, getting back to worship has been under warfare and actually is an act of war ever since. How is worship war? I'm going to jump into Matthew 4, 8 through 10. The devil took him, Jesus Christ, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. See, worship is under warfare here. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. There, it's a weapon of war. Um, and what I mean by that is that Satan's always attacking your worship, trying to get you to focus on yourself, focus on other things, and distract you from actually putting your worship and your service on the Lord. Um, and here Jesus shows us that the word of God, when you engage with the word of God and the Holy Spirit, and that's what's leading your life, and you're submitted into the will of God, and you worship only him, then you can use that very word to send the enemy fleeing from you. There you have used your worship and your submission unto the most high God as your weapon to send the enemy from you. And what can the enemy say to that? When you have when you have refuted his temptations to worship yourself and your own needs and your desires, your pride, your identity, whatever it is, your fears, when you have resisted his temptation and spoken the word of God and submitted yourself under God and said, no, his word reigns over my life, what can the enemy say to that? There is no rebuttal at that point. You've won. Um, I also just really quickly wanted to read this one verse. I just thought it was really cool. It's Psalms 149, 6 through 9. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. This is honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. That right there shows you worship is a weapon. It's showing a picture of people with the high praises of God in their mouth and in their hands a sword. And they have authority over kings and kingdoms because of their submission in worship to the Most High. You become, you become who you're supposed to be in Christ when you step into submission to him. You gain authority and position in him. You gain being his daughter and his son. And then there's nothing that can stand in your way. Okay, I'm wrapping it up here pretty quick, kind of. I sort of promise. Submission to God's will is one of the ultimate forms of worship. I've said it a bunch of times. We serve God's will one of the ways when we love our neighbor as ourselves. Because he says, love me, right? Serve the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, your soul. Um, and then love your neighbor as yourself. So that is a huge way of worshiping and um, serving God's will is loving our neighbor. Jesus modeled this. Um, he declared that he did not come to be served, but to serve. So God, Jesus, fully God, fully man, said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. So here, God is modeling serving your brothers and sisters, taking down your, your, um, your crown and your, your high position and getting low. And I just thought this was so beautiful. By the way, that was Matthew 20, 28, if you want to look it up. But when we bow our will in service to our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're not bowing in worship to them, but we're actually bowing in worship to God and his will and his love and heart and will for others. We become a vessel. We become a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing, like the scripture I read at the beginning. We become an instrument of his hand. And that is such an ultimate form of worship because we're not lifting ourselves up. We're not making our decisions reign supreme. Instead, we're putting someone else ahead of ourselves, which is his desire to serve them, to lay down our lives for them. So that's the ultimate, one of the ultimate forms of worship. Jesus' crucifixion is the, the most major form of worship, in my opinion. Um, he reversed the sin of Adam. Adam chose his will over God's, and uh, thus bowing in worship to the kingdom of Satan. You, here's, the, here's the deal. You either serve God or you serve Satan. It, it's, it's either or. When you're worshiping, you're worshiping one or the other. And unsubmitted worship is typically leaning towards the kingdom of darkness. So examine your heart on that one. Um, Jesus said, though, not my will, but your will, Father. Which this tells us that Jesus had his own fleshly will, right? 
He said, not my will. He said, if this cup could pass from me, let it pass from me. But not my will, your will, Lord. So he had his own will that in that moment he chose to submit under the Father's will. And that lifted Jesus up by stepping under his Father's covering. So he ended up having full authority because he submitted his authority. This was the ultimate act of worship and warfare, where Jesus overcame the original sin. By doing this, by submitting his will, when Adam chose to exalt his own will, he reversed the curse. He overturned sin. He took all of our sin upon him, and then that's how we were able to... um, He became the bridge and the ultimate intercessor where we were able to connect then with God freely and not through all of the animal sacrifices and the veil and the priests and everything, but we have now direct access to the heart of the Father because of Jesus submitting his will and taking on God's will instead. And that's how we can overcome in our lives by doing what Jesus did, submitting our wills through Jesus' blood and the authority that he gave us by doing that. He covers us. He gives us the ability to submit our wills. And he sent the Holy Spirit, the ultimate worship leader, to convict us, to prompt us, to teach us how to worship, to um, teach us. He, He leads us. He illuminates the word for us and brings revelation to our spirit so that we can see where we're not in submission. So it's just, it's amazing. Jesus then, you know, he submitted his will and then sent the Holy Spirit so that we could in turn learn how to do the same. Because in our own nature, we're automatically going to always want to exalt ourselves, our desire, our, um, whatever our passions are, whatever we feel, our emotions can a lot of times be something that we worship a whole lot more than the Lord. We are swayed and moved by how we feel more than what we know is right and truth. And so the Holy Spirit helps us in those moments. And there's a grace that comes upon us through the Holy Spirit when he convicts our hearts and breaks off that mindset and helps us to be transformed and renewed to the mind of Christ. So um, I was I was hesitant that I was going to share this, but because it is Resurrection Sunday. Um, I'm recording this on Saturday, so tomorrow is Resurrection Sunday. But... You know, the word says that if we do not worship, even the very rocks will cry out. And I was reading that one time, and then I asked the Lord, I'm like, Has, you know, you put that in the word. That means there must be some precedent for it, right? Sorry. Um, there must be some precedent for it. And, and I asked the Lord, show me a time that that's actually happened. In your word, show me. Where has this happened? And... I felt this revelation come from the Lord, and you pray on it and see if you get the same thing. I'm not going to say that it's 100%, you know, but this is what I felt. God showed me the story of the crucifixion. He showed me Jesus, and he showed me the story of how it all played out. You know, Jesus coming up on the mountain, getting crucified, up, you know, nailed to the cross, and you have the disciples. Some of them have fled, denied him, denied his name. Some have Judas even hung himself, but they scattered. They weren't by his side. You know, I think there was one disciple, if I'm not mistaken, at the cross with his mother Mary and I think Mary Magdalene. Um, I may be messing that up. I don't have my word in front of me, but, and Jesus is, is hanging on the cross and he says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, taking the sin of them upon himself and becoming the sacrificial lamb. And the disciples, no man at this point knew what was really happening, the spiritual weight of what was taking place. They didn't know that this man, Jesus, the Messiah, was dying for their sin, what he was accomplishing in that moment, how he was the great intercessor and the bridge that was going to tear the veil and split the Temple Mount and, and give us access to the throne room to worship with heaven just by praying and interceding and and going into our worship with the Lord. They didn't know at this point. They were so full of their own emotion and their grief and their brokenness at their Savior, that their, you know, their, their, their rabbi, their teacher, they believed the Messiah that was going to come and change their whole lives physically there on earth. They were just distraught and overcome. And I don't blame them in saying any of this, but I'm trying to kind of paint a picture here that in that moment, they didn't know what they were really seeing. They didn't really understand the full weight of what was happening. And then Jesus breathed his last breath and said, it is finished. 
and that, oh, it just like makes me cry. But in that moment, he was declaring the work I was sent to do for all eternity, past and future, all sin I have just overcome. And there was victory in that statement. It is finished, right? In that moment, there was an earthquake. And the Lord showed me that, you know, it's been preached many times that that earthquake was the groaning and moaning and despair of the earth at what was happening, you know, that the earth was crying out in despair. But God showed me that in that moment, it was the worship pouring out of the rocks. The rocks were crying out because in that moment, man didn't have the revelation to be able to praise him for what had just happened. So the very foundations of the world were crying out and shaking and trembling, just as this word said, that if we don't worship him, the very rocks will cry out. And then again, you see it, because why would there be two earthquakes? I always wondered, what was the point of the earthquake? And then on his resurrection, three days later, the earth shook violently again as the stone was rolled away and Jesus was resurrected. That again was the very rocks, the foundation of the earth crying out in victory. Glory to God, Hosanna, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. It is finished, it is done. And it was, it was giving the praise that we were unable to at that point give because no one had the full revelation of what was happening. And if that doesn't make you wanna worship him, I don't know what will. I just think that is, I don't want the rocks. Now that we have the full revelation of who he is, what he did, what he bought for us, how he's transformed us, the Holy Spirit that he sent, now that we know and we have the word and we can really be transformed and renewed in full revelation and understanding of what Jesus did, I never want the rocks to take my place again. I never want the rocks to have to cry out victory, holy, hosanna, king of kings when there's breath in my body. And so I hope that stirs your heart, and I hope that that is something that teaches you um, to not hold back when you feel that desire to just cry out and worship to him. Lift up your voice. Um, I have gone very long, and I'm very sorry. I'm going to go ahead and read my questions here that I want you guys to discuss. How have you seen your worship change as you've gotten closer to the Lord? So over time, how has your worship changed? What did it used to look like? Was it just 35 minutes on a Sunday morning? What does it look like now and throughout your days? And do you see transformation in your life because of submitting your life and will in worship like Jesus did? Do you see transformation? Do you feel that in your worship you've been transformed? So I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer. I love you guys. I hope that you have awesome discussions. And if you're so bold, maybe take a few minutes and actually worship together. Um, I don't think that that would, that would be too awkward because we all love the Lord. But maybe take a few minutes and, and worship together and just experience what we've talked about tonight. So I thank you, Lord, so much for these people. I thank you for the hearts. I thank you for the opportunity to come and speak life and speak about your um, who you are, Lord, and to even submit in this moment of worship for myself, Lord, going against my will and my fears, and Lord, submitting to you in worship by being obedient to what you've called me to do. I thank you, God, for what you've done in all of our hearts and our lives. I thank you for this season of community groups where you've taught us so much and bonded our hearts together through discussion and fellowship, Lord, and I ask that you further that tonight, and I ask that you anoint the leaders as they lead everyone through this um, discussion and the sermons, Lord, and I just ask that hearts would be vulnerable and open and teachable. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Love you guys.